Right, well, we should start now. We're, well, I'll let Justin tell you exactly where we are. We're just, I'm with Justin Madzu and his daughter Layla. We're going to have two separate conversations in this new uh, category of COVID conversations in Britain in the summer of 2020. And I'll let Justin tell you a little bit about where we are, just for a minute or so, and then introduce himself. And then he's going to tell us what he thinks about this current crisis, how it's been handled, what should have been done, what wasn't done, and uh, some reflections on, on life sure. in Britain in the, the summer of 2020. Over to you, Justin. Well, this is taking me quite by surprise, the subject. <laughs> well, well, you're, well free. you're free. It's called conversation, so you don't have to stick to any uh, particular line, and you can just let your mind go, as it were, just speak spontaneously as you always do I can't do anything else but tell you said something a while ago to me that it should have been technically a very easy thing to do to trace everybody who had it to follow them see who they have come into contact with i mean do you remember telling uh, me that I'm, 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 do you think the government have actually done the right did they lock down to early, too late. What do you think about the lockdown measures they took at the end of March? Yeah. Well, it, um, given the fact that, that they, were, they you know, this whole lockdown did happen in the end, I mean, there's, there's a question that maybe in a way one shouldn't have had lockdown at all, but, um, uh, but, but, they, but, but for the terrible crisis that would have left uh, for, for, for hospitals and so on. But um, I think that, that that uh, in the UK it seemed to be absolutely bizarre that given the, the fact that you could see in Italy there was this terrible crisis going on and you had, you had images of um, uh, Italian police in streets stopping cars even driving from one region to the next and so on. Mm. Um, it seemed impossible that at, at, in the same time you could have people flooding in through Heathrow Airport or Gatwick Airport mm. and everyone was just coming in and out, no, no questions asked, nobody uh, uh, in everyone crowding together, and um, given the fact that these, um, you know, something like um, uh, a, a viral infection, something like a sort of s slow speed nuclear reaction, you know, uh, you, you know, one neutron flies off and it triggers another sort of uranium atom to set up a few more neutrons and then more. New and so before you know it, you have this exponential growth of explosion. So if you if you catch it earlier. Uh, you're, you're stopping it doubling. Uh, if you work out it doubles in so many days, then it, if you simply bring um, your sh your lockdown forward by a week or two, it, it means that the, at the other end you might have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Mm. So it does seem to be rather. Uh, it was confused because you could see that the government making a sort of sudden pivot between oh we don't really mind and you might as well let people all catch the virus and it'll give us a sort of herd immunity mm -hmm. and from there it's suddenly uh, pivoted to oh this is going to be a terrible crisis we better just shut it down now and now we'll start being sensible at which point they weren't prepared that there, there wasn't enough PPE and so on and so forth I mean one of the shocking things for me is to think that um, they could have allowed um, you know, horse racing and chelp them, uh, that, that sort of thing going on, uh, with, with enormous crowds gathered from all over the country to come to see mm. fabulous horse racing. I mean, that's exactly what you would when, want when to do. When did that happen? Well, right at the beginning, just yeah. before lockdown. Mm -hmm. And um, so football matches and a huge gathering in stadiums and so on, you would have thought that if you're going to go down that route, you have to shut those things down first. Mm. Well, for the sake of every, some, anyone who's listening, um, I should just mention that we're sitting in the Botanical Gardens in Oxford, and um, it's a beautiful day. It is the 12th of July, and, um, and, and most people around us are, are, are not with masks, and you wouldn't know just sitting here that you're mm. in a in a immediately post-COVID, so to speak, environment. I don't think we can call it post. -COVID. Yes, it's not post. -COVID, it, I mean, that's no. why I'm calling it COVID conversations. Yes, exactly. We're in the COVID world. Yes, yes. But now the question but, but I have for you. But it doesn't appear so COVID. The question I have for you is this. Uh, excuse me for munching away as I'm speaking, but this is very casual, not professional at all. Um, but 
Um, I must ask now, because if I don't, once Justin gets on a particular track, he's going to be galloping along on that for the next 20 <laughs> minutes and we're not going to have time to get this one in. That's all. Do you not think there's a curious irony in the fact that this coronavirus has hit us in 2020 and they are now predicting that the next coronal or coronal yeah. mass ejection from the sun mm. is pro probably going to take place in the next few years, mm -hmm. which basically, you know, it, it short circuits the whole world. Yes, yeah. No electricity can withstand that. Mm -hmm. So they're now building this huge telescope, Kenneth Inui telescope or something, mm -hmm. in order to start to measure more accurately the electromagnetic fields of the sun. Yeah. So that they get two weeks' notice before the next yeah. coronal mass ejection takes place. Mm -hmm. At the moment, they only have 18 hours' notice, and it's yeah. not enough. Mm -hmm. If they have two weeks, they can at least preserve some of their defense mm -hmm. systems and so on. But the rest of the world plunged into darkness. Yeah. Well, Trillions it, of dollars of damage. It is sort of a coincidence, almost, the word corona. But, mm. but, uh, but I think what it boils down to is that the modern civilization, so-called, I mean, it's the only civilization almost that doesn't deserve the term, but uh, the, 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 the modern world is sort of... Can you explain that? That's going to be startling to many people's ears. Oh, well, well, you know, well the, the thing the is... The that modern civilization is the only civilization that does not deserve the term. Yes, because a civilization has to have a guiding idea that's somehow transcendent, and there has to be... Yeah, and, and, you know, the civilizations we know of, really, are, are, are those which, are, you know, you think of them centered around a prophet with a given dispensation, some religious dispensation. But then, uh, but even the aboriginals... Oh, exactly, I mean, as in the American, the, the, yes. the American Indians. They yes. don't have a particular prophet, yes. but they just have the tradition where the whole so, so, the universe is basically... So you, you, and actually, one of the things that I find particularly um, telling in this is... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the saying of uh, um, Jesus, uh, who says, that, you know, you shall know them by their fruits. Mm. The, the, the fruits of the modern world, although they're rather sort of um, dazzling in some respects, like an iPhone or, or, or you know, uh, studying quantum mechanics or modern cosmology or whatever it may be, um, it's, a, it's like a veneer, and underneath it is really rather ugly. There's, there's a sort of pointlessness mm -hmm. uh, to life. A, a, people have been reduced to sort of human machines working, uh, uh, laboring. There, there's no sort of value in your work Let quite, just quite often. add something to that. I've just come from a, a, a hotel. I better not mention the name. In, um, where was I? Either Cambridge or Norwich. I forget which hotel I was in there. But um, I went into the room, yeah. and I saw little bits of fluff on the carpet, as if it obviously hasn't been hoovered. And I said to the receptionist, I'm very sorry to complain, but you know, this, in these times we can't afford to be slack of mm. cleanliness. And mm. it's, clearly this hasn't been hoovered. It's just, I'm terribly sorry, sir, but it was hoovered by a robot. Oh, I see. <laughs> and the robot didn't see it. <laughs> what happens is the robot kind of bumps along and it yes, just carries yeah. on until it hits something and then moves. Yes, yes. And she told me that um, they're planning, uh, uh, McDonald's are planning to replace all their staff with robots. Yes. So right. just to add to what you're saying, this yeah, is yes. the kind of civilization that we, yes. we've come to. But carry on. I don't want to stop you in your flow. So you said that Western civilization is the only civilization that probably does not deserve the term. Yes, and and, and and you can tell it in the same ways that you shall know them by their fruits. If you see if you see something extraordinarily beautiful, like if you see Aboriginal art painted on uh, cave walls, or mm. even you know Cro Magnum, uh, or whatever it is, uh, you know Neanderthal art, or uh, early human art, in, you know in France or Spain in some of these early caves, you can see that it's uh, something beautiful, mm. and. Uh, but you, you see a lot of the modern age, and you, you see sort of um, mountains of plastic in back streets. You, uh, everything's iron and concrete. Uh, you, you know, there's um, the, the underbelly of the, the modern age is really rather uh, unattractive. Mm. And it, it, it's, is it's it telling. That, is it true that viruses as such began with, um, was it with, with modern agriculture, or, or was it 
with the establishment of agriculture as opposed to the nomadic lifestyle? No, I, I think viruses have been around uh, from the for eons. From agriculture. You know, uh, uh, no, no they, they, they've always been around. And um, No, but not before, oh, not but, when but, we were but, nomads. But, but infectious viruses. 82,000 years ago, when we turned to agriculture yes. and stopped being nomadic herdsmen, yeah. apparently that's when bacteria and viruses got out of control because there were large oh. amounts of grain being stored alongside livestock and human beings yeah. in in settlements and yeah. that was that, that's when viruses and stuff got, yes, got going apparently yes I, I don't know about that but i, I imagine once you have large uh, uh, concentrations of human population it'll attract all sorts of problems and diseases mm. Uh, mm. let me just um Oh, uh, Justin has just startled me out of my wits by saying that a virus is actually a marvellous creature. And, I'm go and we're sitting here with Leila, who is his daughter, um, and I'm going to ask her reaction to that statement as well. So this is going to be a joint interview, it's not going to be two separate ones. Well, it's, it, uh, I'm just saying that, you know, any of God's creations, I mean, if, if you look at them, they're, they're, firstly, it's not for nothing that they exist. All right, but, they, uh, but please, just but, go back. What, what, how did you describe the virus just now? Well, I might have, it, off, uh, off, uh, you know, off that recording. Just say it again. It's a marvelous creature. But I, actually, yeah. because every creature is marvelous. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, uh, yes, it's a. I mean, a, a virus. I mean, when you look at it, it's such an extraordinary thing because a virus is almost um, something between a, a living thing and an inanimate thing. It's like it's like it's like part of the machinery of a cell. Do you understand that? Maybe? Yes, I think Late. viruses are amazing, actually. Really? Even though they can do a lot of damage. Yeah. I mean, a lot of things in the world can do a lot of damage. A lot of animals can do a lot of damage. Like, me and Daddy, we were watching yeah. that, that thing with that oh. giant meat-eating cricket, which is oh. quite disgusting. A what? Uh, a meat-eating cricket. cricket? It was horrible. No. Uh, but the fact that it... Meat-eating cricket. Yes. Yes, it, it was yes. really horrible. But the fact that it could climb up trees and squirt venom in things' eyes and eat little oh birds, goodness. I mean, it was horrible, but it was amazing. I mean, I mean it's extraordinary what, the, the, what something can be designed to do. I mean, it is sort of ugly. I mean, I wouldn't choose it as one of my favorites. I mean, I'd much rather talk about a swan or a... Or a salmon fish, or something. But but there are viruses. What Do you mind if I just before you stop? Just one thing that yes. I want to tell our, our listeners that Justin coined a wonderful phrase. <laughs> everyone talks about killing two birds with one stone, and he reacted and said, "Well, why don't we just say we will feed two birds with one scone?" <laughs> Did I say that? You don't, don't you forgot? That? I've totally forgotten. Oh, that. come on! I have. Now he also took, calls me his autobiographer. <laughs> Yes, his I, autobiographer. Yes, because I, I, I couldn't do it for myself. Right. So, um, Go on. So, no, but, but a virus, I mean, for instance, um, uh, I've always been fascinated by things where uh, different parts of the animal world uh, or the, uh, uh, the animal kingdom come together and collaborate in extraordinary ways. For instance, like, if you, if you think of a gall, uh, on an oak tree, you know, you sometimes see these little round um, galls, mm -hmm. and they used to make what ink. What is a gall? A gall, it's it's like a growth. It's almost like a G A W L. Little, yes, and on on oak trees, you see them, and what, and you wonder what it is. And if you look at them closely, an old one, which is big, gone sort of brown, dark brown, they've got a little tiny hole in them. And if you if you pick it and then break it open, it, it's like it's got a pulpy inside. It's got a very very hard outside. This is one type of gall. And um, in the middle uh, is a little sort of space, and you realize that there's been a little creature in the center of this gall which has been fed by the oak tree. And in fact, if you trace the, the life cycle of this gall and, and the little wasp that creates it, the, 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 the wasp um, is a little grub inside this little um, wonderful haven that's being created by an oak tree. It's a perfect nursery where the food is being fed to a little wasp to live inside what would normally have grown into a leaf bud. Mm. But instead of it being a leaf, uh, the leaf uh, bud that grow, should have grown into a leaf actually turns into this fantastic uh, structure that's got nothing to do with an oak tree. And how can this little wasp have ever have collaborated with a tree to give it this perfect setting 
for it to, uh, and how could the wasp have ever uh, uh, injected something into the tree which could have adjusted the tree's own um, biological plan of how to grow a leaf and it modified that to turn it into a perfect round ball which has a beautiful pulpy center which then feeds the grub at the middle and which has a which has a shell that's almost impervious to outside uh, creatures but then the grub inside can have strong enough teeth to be able to drill its way out of this this center the extraordinary thing about these galls also is they have a double life cycle they they come out as little wasps they mate as wasps but then what uh, what the wasp does is not to go and then infect uh, the next uh, leaf bud for the oak tree to make next year's galls. The, the, the wasp then goes and drills down to the tips of the roots of the tree underground. It injects the roots of the tree and creates a different sort of gall underground. Mm. And a different looking creature seems to come out, a different one to the wasp. Mm. And then when that one comes out, so the, the, this little wasp has a way of controlling the oak tree in two different areas, creating two different wonderful homes for two almost different types of creatures. And then this little creature then comes back up, that one mates, and then that's the one that lays its egg that becomes the little wasp grub that flies out of the gall. How does nature manage to conceive how to do this? It's, a very, it's almost impossible to think how an evolutionary path might have led to such a thing. I mean, I'm not so against the idea that evolution could have even taken place, but what's clear is well, that you can't... That, so, sorry, no, no, but let me say, but the, the, the clear thing in my mind is if anything like evolution is taking place, it couldn't have happened without a guiding mind, if you see what I mean. There has to be design. There has to be mind and design and consciousness of some kind behind all this wonder. Mm, and so when I say a, a virus is something extraordinary and beautiful, it's just staggering to see, well, firstly, the DNA inside a cell is, is possibly the most complex thing that is in existence. Possibly, in, if we're the only creatures that live on a planet, then, then, then it would be the most extraordinary thing in the entire universe. But um, there's most probably other life forms in some other uh, realm. But um, this little microscopic um, molecule has these unbelievable characteristics to the way it winds itself up, folds itself up into this infinitesimally small little package at the center of a cell that you can't even see that your skin is made of. And each of your little cells, your invisible cells on your skin, has <coughs> one of these in microscopically miraculous little centers mm. of uh, DNA wrapped up and folded away. Now, a virus is like a piece of that DNA that travels on its own without its own oh, cell. Oh, oh, oh. Do you understand <coughs> all this, Leila? Um, so, so no. <laughs> <laughs> you mean, you've heard... <coughs> no, no, she's, no, she's, uh, she's, just, she's uh, looking at the flowers, I think. <laughs> But you've heard all this before from Daddy. That's yeah, why. I'm sure, I'm sure I have. Well, well, something longer. No, but the, so the extraordinary thing is that the virus is like a piece of this DNA mm -hmm. in its own little, very basic shell. It has all it has to have is some very basic mechanism of somehow being able to invade or get its way into the cell. And what's is inside the cell, just like that little wasp that makes its own little universe out of what would otherwise have been a, 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 an oak leaf. It then turns the cell into a machine just for reproducing itself. Mm. It's almost, um, but, but it itself is nothing other than one of the cogs of a machine. Uh, that if you think of the cell as being like a very highly complex machine, it's just like another little piece of a cog, but it takes over the machine to make more of itself. So it's like a, a machine that would normally m manufacture all sorts of wonderful different objects, then gets turned into a machine that just produces one type of cog. And then the cogs explode out, and then they all land into other cells. But the killing aspect. I yeah, but in a way, you know, to um, one of God's names in the Islamic tradition is al mumit in a certain sense, Which there's a, uh, the, that, uh, the one who brings death or who creates death. Because it's not nothing that you have a sort of mechanism where all of life is balanced in such a way that things in their right time, in the right place, actually come to an end. I mean, imagine the horror of, you know, if we all lived uh, uh, um, indefinitely and that we could never die. You know, you need all sorts of diseases, you need all sorts of 
mechanisms to actually let there be a balance between all the different creatures that live together on Earth. And viruses are part of that. And of course you can find very positive things in viruses. For instance, now we're in medicine, people who have certain genetic disorders, uh, who have got like a little piece missing out of their gene, uh, I mean, if you've got like cystic fibrosis type of problems and so on, people can work out, ah, oh, that, that's that. If you isolate, uh, you can work out, ah, oh, that particular gene in that in monstrous chain of DNA, just that tiny little piece there is missing for some, it's like a sort of mistake. We can actually help this person. And if we could get a little a bit of that uh, correct DNA back into the cell, it, we could then get that person well again. But of course, you'd have to get into a lot of their cells. So what you do at modern science is using viruses as this wonderful tool now. So you take a virus uh, and you say to it, look, uh, attach this little piece that we're missing, bind it to your own little machinery. And while you're in there creating mayhem, like you're giving somebody a cold or, or a sort of flu, which is not too serious, just carry this with you as you go into all of those cells. And while you're in there, just spread this wonderful missing piece into the body of this person. I mean, there's no other machinery you could imagine that could actually conduct these little pieces into the into a body of a person. But but here but here we are. You know, you have viruses. You can adapt, and you can actually cure all sorts of illnesses. Of course, the the meddling with things at the biological level, I'm very much against. I mean, it's all very well to say we can do these wonderful things, but I think on balance, you do more harm than good. Uh, because meddling with biology at that level is, you know, we don't know how the, the world is all related to, uh, how all organisms are related to each other. We've got no right to be, I mean, for instance, that there are sheep that exist that you can milk, and out of their milk you can distill the, um, uh, the, the substance that used for a spider's web. And you say, well, how, how on earth is this spider's web material here? And you're told, oh, it's easy enough. We took a spider, we edited that little bit of gene in the spider that makes the spider's web material, which is very expensive and useful to have. And since we want to have a lot of spider's web material, we can't grow thousands of spiders and try and milk them all for their spider's web. So we'll just edit that gene into a sheep, and then we'll milk the sheep, and then we'll distill the milk, and then there's the, the, the substance that we have after. I mean, this kind of meddling, it's, it's like, um, it's, it's even beyond... Um, Frankenstein and so on. It, it, it really is quite monstrous. You have a perfectly normal sheep walking around and it, it's actually biologically being sort of mated inherently with a piece of spider. Mm. I mean, where would that sort of thing stop? Mm. I mean, the, the, the modern age, the fact that it's discovered possibilities of doing things, it, it, it's, it, it's going to unleash a sort of Pandora's box and we'd never be able to put all this back in the box. Mm. And uh, modern science doesn't seem to have any sort of guiding principle as to where the limits are mm. of what it can and can't do. Mm. And of course, everything is done under the name of it's, it's an obvious good. I mean, it's, it's obviously good to have medicines that stop children dying in childhood. Uh, in childhood. But if, if you actually remove all these diseases, uh, then you end up with huge global populations. And the huge global populations then would... would uh, I mean, if, if you have uh, endless billions of people on the on the earth, it's going to uh, eventually it's it's going to end up in a terrible place, mm. uh, and and then we we could end up eradicating all the other life forms on, on earth. Mm. And uh, I mean, I'm sure, you know, in my children's lifetimes, there'll be animals like elephants and tigers that'll just go missing. I mean, uh, imagine a, a human civilization actually end up without such treasures that we've inherited. Mm. And then you have other people talking about, oh, well, never mind, we'll just hop in a spaceship and try and find another planet at the other end of the universe. Someone's trying to colonize Mars. Like yeah, yes, yes uh, man, uh, uh, Elon, Elon, Musk. Elon Musk. Well, it's, it's all uh, Elon Musk. That's there you go. I mean, it's all, well, it's all rather brilliant, but the thing is, I think it's much better to uh, work on what you have than on trying to explore something that, I mean, I, I think it's much, uh, uh, the priority, the human priority now, clearly, is to save the planet before it grows to a crisp in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, well, well, we're going to have this runaway... Um, I mean, and the thing is, I mean, uh, Elon Musk is going to Mars to colonize Mars, but he can see the problem that we're having here is exactly the problem that happened to Mars. Mars, we already know, had rivers and also it might have had life for all we know, but it certainly had rivers and, and, and water and it was a very sort of 
uh, fabulous environment, but all of that evaporated away. And it, it would have evaporated away because of its atmosphere having too much of a certain sort of gas and whatever, it would have been overheated and that would have been it. And that's why there's, there's hardly a drop of water left on Mars. Mm. Earth could easily end up as a planet which has no water all evaporated as away. As you were speaking, I couldn't help thinking about <coughs> that film, The Matrix. Oh, yes. Have you seen that later? No. Oh, it's a, it's, it's a groovy movie, you could say. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's basically that. It, it, it's where human beings have, have destroyed the planet and the machines have taken over. But they need to keep the human beings alive because they're the only source of, of energy. But they keep them alive in this what You better explain. I don't know. This uh, I've heard they put them to sleep. Yes. Yeah, they're they're like they're, sort of living in their brain. That, that's right. So, so, so they live in their minds or in the matrix of the machine. And so so their, their minds are happy. So they're, they're very happy living inside this world. But their reality is actually they don't see themselves because they, they don't see that they're just a body lying in a um, uh, in some factory, which is having the heat extracted from it for these other creatures. But uh, so, but it, it, it's it's the wonderful thing about the film is how the dream seems to be the reality for the people within it, and in fact, some people in the dream discover that they are in the dream. And they very heroically manage to escape the dream, but then they end up in this ghastly-looking world where they're all in this this horrible uh, uh, factory where human beings are used to be to be plugged into, and there's actually nothing very lovely going on there. But in the in their dream world, they have all that they need. You know, they have movies, they have lovely clothes, they they they, they have this, that, and the other. And in fact. Uh, there's a sort of tension between characters in the story where some of the characters who have heroically escaped from this uh, the dream actually betray some of the other ones simply because they they strike a deal with, with, with the with the aliens who've been sort of running the um the matrix the machine yeah, the, the machine so because they, they'd rather be in the dream having a lovely time than to be outside in reality having a miserable time do you remember that great scene where one of them one of the Judas figures, in yeah. fact. It's all. It's also based on two two kind of themes. One is the is Plato's cave analogy that people are in. A, you know that. And the other one is is basically Jesus, the one who's chosen as a man called Neo, and he's the Messiah. He's the symbol for the Messiah. So he's betrayed by someone, the Judas figure, who goes back into the Matrix and tells them, "Look, this this." This man's going to undo all of the work. And they say, well, you know, we can give you everything. And then he's got this hamburger in his hand. And he says, I know this is not real, but it tastes so good. <laughs> That's right. So, but, but in a way, dream, a dream hamburger is good at its own level. You know, a, a dream hamburger no, is worth having. Virus. If you're, uh, back it's back, back by to the virus. The, well, the, the virus, where, where were we? So, uh, yes, so viruses can be good or they can be bad. But intrinsically, they have a certain beauty. But of course, all of nature is, has its own beauty. But the things, there are ugly things in nature and there are very beautiful things in it. There's a sort of hierarchy of beautiful things. I mean, for instance, of all the animals on the savanna, you could say, well, the lion is the most majestic. Yeah. But there are, there's a hyena on the, hyenas aren't that majestic by comparison. They're all sort of scruffy. Uh, uh, they get a bad press uh, from what I've heard, but but still, still, they're not the most charming creatures. And, uh, you know, so you, you, you can... So amongst uh, the natural world, you know, there the, the, the will, uh, um, I mean, the, the, the world isn't paradise. So there will be ugly things in it. Uh, there, there will be things that one could call evil, or there will be things that you, 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 you know, sort of bizarre goings on, or bizarre creatures that seem to do sort of um, horrible kind of things. And you, you think, well, how could a creator manifest all of this if he's so good and beautiful? And yeah, um, Leila, I've just come back from Nor. I've just come from Norwich, and I went to visit the shrine of uh, Saint Julian. Mm -hmm. You may not have heard of her. Um, and what she's most famously known for is a statement that Jesus uh, uttered to her in one of his in one of the visions that she had of him, and she was troubled by all of the evil, the suffering, and so on. And he said to her, "All shall be well, and all manner 
of thing shall be well. Mm -hmm. That sums up what your father's saying. Also, thing in early English was a bit like sheep. You know, a, a thing means it can be like the word sheep, a one sheep, or it can be many sheep. And, and, and the early English thing would be singular or plural. So, so when she said all manner of things shall be well, she yeah. meant uh, in modern language, you say all manner of things shall be well. <laughs> so that's. Uh, no, but it's a wonderful thing to know that. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, and in a way, the world is a place where we're, we're tried, you know, to, uh, you have to sort of perceive the beauty through some of the earthly uh, lack of beauty, let's say. But, um, well, that's a, a good place to stop. Would you like to just sum up in a, in a minute or two what, where, well, oh, uh, to sum up in a minute or two what... What do you think we all should be doing in terms of diminishing our, our sense of vulnerability, um, anxiety, panic? Because I've heard that many, many people have committed suicide. Oh. Many divorces are going on. Mm. What would be your personal advice to people going through psychological and emotional traumas in this difficult time? Ooh, this a, Just a minute or two. Yeah. Have well, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost an impossibly difficult question, but um, I, I think um, in a certain sense that the solution to all problems, whether it's COVID, not COVID, whatever it is, it's, it's, I, I think the only solution to all difficulties is to return to the things that are essential. And what's essential is to know that you're human, that you have this conscious mind, that you have a capacity to uh, think, to love, to be yourself, so to speak. And, you know, what one has to simply return to that. And then, and then in the recognition of who you are yourself, you realize that I'm not just the sort of cosmic burp that happened because some, you know, the Big Bang happened and then evolution, there's some sort of mindless thing came along and I'm just some sort of little com combination of molecules bumping around. And I'm, a I'm actually a meaningless creation. No, I'm, you have to think, well, I, if you have that thought in a way, nothing is going to make things better. But if you can return to the idea that actually this is not a cosmic burp, that you are not an accident and you're not here for nothing, and this is, it is not just all chance, so to speak, that you're part of design. And this design, and the de when you look around you and you see like a little virus and you see whatever, it is, you think, my goodness, this, this uh, designer is something absolutely miraculous. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you have that notion, this designer is awesome. This designer is stupendous. And in fact, I, sta I, I stand trembling before it almost, with, with almost with joy. That's, that's the thing that can save you in any environment. It doesn't matter if you're in a COVID situation or not. Because once you realize that there's nothing that's by chance, that there is this great... Uh, something behind the veil of the world we live in. Um, whatever your circumstances, you could be Nelson Mandela in prison, you could be sitting in the most beautiful place on earth, whatever, you can always close your eyes, withdraw to the center and know. So, so in a certain sense, the solution to the COVID problem, to any individual, anything that might trigger that individual to realize it's not just the immediate noise of your environment, and being lost in that noise that matters. You simply just have to stand outside yourself for a second and realize you're something magical. And that's the, the, that's the sort of um, hope. But the problem is how do you get that magical idea into somebody's mind when they're suffering or, or feeling that they're, they're, you know, they're next month they're not going to be able to pay for anything because their bank account's now empty and how they're ever going to get a job mm. and how am I going to get out of this illness and now I'm feeling very unwell. Oh, here we've got little ants crawling over you. That's the luxury of being in, in a garden. That's all right. Um, so, are they, are they, are they, are they, are they are they the soldier ants or the killer ants? No, no, they're little nibbly ants. 
Here we are. <laughs> but the, I think when you le- lean down, you leaned into their territory, and they oh. thought, "Ah, oh, we're gonna we're gonna take this monster down." <laughs> right. right. But but how to get that across? I, 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 it's it's hard to know because the modern civilization has been so on the wrong path for so long, and it's sort of bred. Uh, so to speak, uh, 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 masses of people who don't have normal education in a spiritual sense, let's say. And this is uh, what's happening to me now yes. is exactly what you're talking about with these little ants that are trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, and uh, and uh, I suppose the attitude I should have is to is to make contact with their consciousness yeah. and to say to them. Yeah, I'm a friend. You don't yeah. have to take me down. Well, 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 well they, 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 they don't know that. They're, 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 just, they're, they're just doing what they know how, what to do best. But there, but there are nice, uh, well, you could say that there's sort of positive things that seem to be happening. I mean, one, one wonderful thing is that the COVID crisis has made people realize that, um, you know, there are other crises uh, that need to be dealt with as severely as the COVID crisis. But given the fact that everyone's been talking about global warming as the, as the essential crisis, because that's, uh, that's actually exi- an existential crisis where we could all perish. And that is being tr- treated in a very trivial way by all politicians. But as soon as it comes down to sort of an economic issue or a sort of political issue like, oh, we might lose so many workers or there might be a sort of crisis in our health center, then suddenly the whole world is prepared to throw any amount of money at the problem to see if they can sort of stave, stave the problem. But, but nobody's thinking in the same way about saving the globe. But we could possibly come out of this and actually realize that we've actually got to um, throw ourselves into the saving of the planet in the same way that we did for saving ourselves from COVID, and in, in, if, if that sort of um, if that comes out of it, uh, it'll be a very good thing. Inshallah, God willing. God willing. Thank you very much, Justin. <laughs>